sitting in a hot tub doesn't make you infected. You know, douching doesn't make you infected. Um, you know, if you go to the bathroom all the time, you're constantly in the toilet, that doesn't make you infected. You know, if you are uh, not wiping perfectly, it doesn't necessarily cause infection. You know, if you're overweight, that doesn't cause infection. If you're using really tight tights, um, that doesn't cause infection. But when you think about menopause, of course, you know, we have less estrogen and things are sensitive yeah. and thinner down there. And so it's kind of all wrapped into one in a way. So we're here together this afternoon, the Menopause Collective. Thank you so much for coming along and sharing this discussion. We're talking all about women's health. We're talking menopause. And today, specifically, we're talking all about urinary tract infections. And this is something that can come to visit us in middle life. It's an unwanted, unwelcome guest. And, uh, and sometimes we can be suffering with urinary tract infections for a prolonged period of time. And this really can take away from our quality of life. And so, first of all, to welcome the collective. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we've got Dr. B, fresh from Seattle. Hello there. And uh, Jackie Wer. Jackie's our resident hypnotherapist. And Claire, Claire's our resident natural medicine woman. So. We're tackling this topic from lots of different angles, but uh, Dr. B has 25 years worth of experience in helping women deal with these kinds of issues. And so uh, what if you were experiencing a urinary tract infection and you were in any doubt, what, what might you be experiencing? Well, let me say, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, when I thought about this topic, um, I'm one of those lucky women that really, uh, until a certain point, had never had, uh, a, we'll just call a UTI, urinary tract infection, a UTI. And um, forever in a day, I always got frustrated when I'd be paged at, you know, oh, dark 30 in the morning and 3 a.m. It's like, I got to have an antibiotic. It's like, you know, I'm, not, I'm in bed right now. And it drove me nuts until... I got my first one and then I thought, oh my God, if I don't get treated in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to die. <laughs> So, so yes, I, I apologize to those infinite number of women that I kind of thought, oh, could they just not have waited until 8 a.m. when my phone's turned? No. So, you know, not everyone has those dramatic symptoms, but often it can start in a dime uh, or you just feel like, oh, there's some pressure and things aren't kind of working right. Or maybe you're peeing a bit more. It's not coming out or maybe it's stinky or it's different color and it's different for every woman. Um, but, but, but the bad ones, you know, can really, really hurt. Um, uh, it can be hard to get the urine out. You're not completely avoiding extremely painful, like razor blades painful. Every woman who's had that is not in their head. And, you know, when, you, when you're bleeding at the same time, you think, oh, my God, I'm dying. And so, um, but, you know, fast track to women who've had many of those over time, they kind of, they know, they just know when, some, when something's coming on. It's like, oh, here we go again. And sometimes they can trace it back to something they did or maybe they didn't do. So that's kind of the gist of the symptoms that, that many women have. So can we just, uh, you mentioned blood then, and I'm assuming you're talking about peeing blood. Yes, yes, she's wondering. Yeah, so uh, I was I wasn't clear, so I wanted to be absolutely clear on that. Um, I know they do test, don't they? The dipstick test for blood in the urine, and for the most part, you're talking microscopic amounts, and you don't actually see it, do you? As as a red, you know, color or anything. But uh, it might be that you might even be able to perceive it in the urine. Is that what you're saying? Some women look like they're peeing blood. I mean, the urine's so bloody. Uh, that could sometimes be indicative of, of a, more of a pyelonephritis, which is a kidney infection. But it's still just what we call hemorrhagic cystitis, which means it's nasty UTI. Okay. So, you know, I'm going to just take a straw poll. Is this something that we've got experience of in the room? Oh, yes. Okay. So this is, you know, this is important because I think, as you said, everyone's experience can, can be different and getting in tune with what it might be for you uh, is, a, is a, an exercise in, an, in itself sometimes. And, and I know that women can be tested and come up with negative results and yet their intuition is telling them, yelling at them, that this is the, an infection. But the genital urinary syndrome of menopause is something that uh, we, 
we can experience through menopause. That is uh, vaginal dryness that results in painful symptoms, uh, pain as you walk even, uh, urinary symptoms. And so there can be confusion around whether or not it's a bacterial infection that is the source of the problem. And, um, and Claire, you're nodding because you, you did put your hand up and say that this was something that you had experienced for yourself. So Claire, how, how was that experience for you? Well, I would, I, I'll just say before I launch into my experience that oh. um, I see a lot of people that actually have just got the irritation. They don't have the um, full blown infection as a result result of being dry you know it's like what they're eating etc the bladder irritation mm -hmm. so it feels like a UTI but it isn't actually a UTI yeah. um, it's just that kind of yeah it's eating and drinking and then a reaction in the bladder that's causing the body to kind of just want to keep voiding which in itself creates inflammation and irritation and it's just like a vicious circle um, my experience was I got it on my honeymoon oh. and I landed up, it came on literally as I hit the airport and I landed up, bless these stewardesses, traveling back from the Cook Islands in the toilet um, because I was bleeding. I was peeing mm. blood as we discussed. It had gone, it got so bad that I couldn't actually sit in my seat. So they let me land on the toilet, <laughs> which I didn't think you could do. And then I had a wheelchair to transfer me to different flights until I got to UK. And they were like, typical unfriendly UK, deal with it. And funnily enough, I had to after like crying my eyes out and thinking, how am I going to walk? How am I going to go anywhere? I just feel like I'm leaking. Um, but it was okay after that. And then I got some, that's when I discovered over here, I don't know if you use it, Dr. B, over there, but we have a tree bark that we call d manos which is like oh, a white manos. powder that we really recommend and a lot of friends of mine who get the repeat repetitive cystitis really rate this stuff and i do too because it's natural and it literally causes immediate relief as opposed to something pharmaceutical so um yeah that was my experience uh, yeah, D-manose is just sugar. Uh, and uh, that's actually how, you know, we, we can talk about cranberries in a minute, but um, cranberries convert to fructose, which is a form of sugar. And so fructose and glucose uh, are actually bind on the urothelial lining, which is the lining of the urinary tract, uh, and kind of will help repel, so to speak, um, some back certain types of bacteria, especially like E. coli, from landing there and causing infection. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just basically sugar. Uh, and um, if you look at, and I, you know, I, I embrace both sides of medicine and, and holistic and Western as well. Uh, if you look at the studies, you know, the, the FDA here, uh, none of them have been proven, but boy, every woman knows if you find something that works, I don't care if it's placebo or not, if it works, it works. <laughs> How do you spell it? D dash Amazon Mary, A double N O S E. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. I see even I, I, I knew about it, but I, I didn't know how to spell it either, it turns out. Um, but that's interesting. I'm, I love the way that you explained how that works, because, you know, I think this is really important that people don't just have a, you know, do this, do that, do the other, but they actually understand a little bit around why are we doing these things and why they might actually be working for you um, and so we do personally I err towards natural approaches wherever possible but you know there are the uh, the times when that is is not going to be adequate um, but what I did want to touch on really is prevention so the, the measures that would really help us to guard against this uh, what sounds like can be quite a horrendous experience um, and I know that, you know, you can, with the best will in the world, you might be doing all of these things and still get an infection. However, to understand the measures that we might take, you know, the fluid balance is, is really important, isn't it? Uh, Jackie? Um, I haven't experienced one um, for a good while. And certainly not a bad one for a, a very long while. This is something that I really struggled with more as a young woman than now. Um, and oh my 
goodness, I got myself into some states that much like you, Claire, in, in situations where I, I just couldn't walk, I couldn't move, I'd be crawling along the floor in utter mm -hmm. agony. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really, it's really funny because as I'm older now, I can even look back and think um, I actually was even capable of bringing them on through worrying about having one. I could actually, I, I honestly thought to myself, oh my gosh, I'm going to have one through literally just worrying about it. And then I could, with the stress of it, create the underlying feeling that I was going to have a UTI. I couldn't go anywhere without antibiotics. I was so scared I was going to get um, a UTI at some point in time. But, you know, that, that kind of sort of leads into where I'm at now because there, there is a link and there are research papers on stress being linked, you know, through the adrenal fatigue or poor diet, lack of sleep, um, mm -hmm. you know, so all of these contributing factors that we're maybe just not noticing that uh, can contribute it to it. And obviously as well, when we are stressed, our immune system is being depleted. So if nice. there is something there, then we're leaving ourselves open to infection. So for me, it's, you know, it's stress relief techniques that uh, I recommend all the way. But that's for every aspect of life because it's not just, you know, UTIs. It's, it's everything, isn't it? When we can manage stress, we're a heck of a lot healthier. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is interesting that the, the, we, we start to hear the same dialogue in lots of different contexts. Um, I think there are specific pieces of advice that might apply in, in, a, in this particular situation that maybe don't in others. Definitely managing the overall levels of uh, stress. And I mean, unexplained anxiety, mm -hmm. worrying without even wanting to is something that happens to you in the menopause. Yeah. And, and so it can be a really hard habit to break uh, if, if you had a propensity to be that way inclined anyway. And then, you know, your hormones start chipping away at your confidence and, uh, you know, and everything else. You know, something that I think about often is well, natural things. We're back to natural things. Natural fibres in underwear. Lycra has its place. Claire's shaking her head. Not in the gusset. But definitely not. In a, that is exactly where you don't want it, isn't it? And so the good old 100% cotton underwear. Now, you, you are going to see a bit, a bit of a, a VPL there, aren't you, with the 100% cotton underwear and, and deodorized products that were put in into our washing machine, tumble dryers. Did I say deod? Well, maybe the deodorizing, mm -hmm. but in, in fact, the creating odors and chemical constituents. And, and this can contribute, can't it, to uh, uh, the instance of irritation, maybe not infection as such, but definitely that sensation that might lead you to then start down the worry wormhole uh, and think, oh my goodness, this is on its way. So um, we talked about the fluid balance. We've talked a little bit about uh, your thoughts and, and how worrying and stress and all of that. Uh, the cotton underwear. Is there anything we could add to that, Dr. V, do you think? Well, you know, it was struck, struck me as you were talking about the differences um, in my mind being a physician between infection and irritation or dryness. And so, uh, you know, if, if you actually, it, it's actually compellingly simple. There are very, very discreet reasons for getting infection. Uh, and they hearken to thinking about Jackie's uh, younger years, um, you know, behavioral, uh, new sex partners, uh, whether you use spermicide, you know, condoms have spermicide as well. Uh, all of that can be linked to, to uh, UTIs. Uh, there are urologic factors. So uh, if you have incontinence issues, that can be an issue. I mean, urine is the most toxic substance to the skin. And so when it sits there touching your skin, hmm, and, you know, our rectum, uh, anatomical speaking, it's okay to talk about that, is close behind. And so, you know, that's where bacteria come from. Um, if you have a cystocele, cystocele which is like a pushing, uh, or 
pooching out and you're going about the bladders pushing into the um uh the, the vaginal uh, canal and affects the urethra and then post voiding residual urine so you just don't get all the urine off every time and then the other factors actually they're looking into things like biologic um you know we can't blame our mothers for everything but um you know there are patterns that are that are perhaps genetic and that's where they're looking at this fascinating science about how the how pathogens or bacteria adhere to the epithelial cells, the lining of the urinary tract. So that's purely um, the infection risks. Fascinatingly, because I think I spent most of my life thinking the other way, um, sitting in a hot tub doesn't make you infected. You know, douching doesn't make you infected. Um, you know, if you go to the bathroom all the time, you're constantly in the toilet, that doesn't make you infected. You know, if you are uh, not wiping perfectly, it doesn't necessarily cause infection. You know, if you are overweight, that doesn't cause infection. If you're using really tight tights, um, that doesn't cause infection. But when you think about menopause, of course, you know, we have less estrogen and things that are sensitive and thinner down there. And so it's kind of all wrapped into one in a way. Mm. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? It, it is um, a veritable minefield when we start to think of all the different contributory factors. But it is good to dispel a few myths. And uh, and the hot tub's a good one because nearly everybody's got one in the garden nowadays. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, let's be clear that we can happily sit in the hot tub. Maybe uh, you don't want to sit for too long, too hot, because that's not good if we raise the core temperature too much, is it? But anyway, that's a conversation for another day. Um, and I think, you know, what you were talking about, this sort of potential for genetic propensity to these kinds of things, you know, why is it that me sitting here, had, you know, in the history of my life, I think once, and probably it wasn't even actually a proper UTI. What is it about that? And so um, I'm currently reading the book Dirty Genes. I don't know if anybody else has, has seen or heard that. Uh, you know, the gene sequences, and maybe there is one that, that just predisposes us to have this propensity, uh, you know, maybe the bacteria to be able to attach. Uh, pH actually is something that we didn't talk about, did we? Uh, you mentioned cranberry juice, and my understanding around cranberry juice uh, as a sort of uh, first line of treatment, if you like, was that it was something to do with the pH. Now, I'm not sure that that's right, is it? No, Dr. B shaking well, it off. You know, I for a very long time automatically associated, you know, anything that we're taking in naturally is changing the pH and therefore making that environment uninhabitable. And, you know, that's kind of old knowledge, even though it's still in my brain thinking that way. So the more common understanding is that uh, it's, it's the sugar attaching to the molecules, attaching to the receptors. But, you know, the pH does factor into this. And um, I'm sure Claire will nod her head about, you know, thinking about um, the uh, uh, other kinds of supplements you can take. Um, lactobacillus in particular that can uh, produce hydrogen peroxide which lowers the pH makes the environment more acidic and that can especially chase away or deter E. coli which is the most common uh, bacterial cause of bladder infections. Um, so cranberry products um, they're not changing the pH, they add fructose into the picture. Uh, and then d mano same thing at sugar, uh, methanamine or methanamine uh, and or vitamin C with that kind of acidifies the urine. Interestingly, it, it turns it to formaldehyde. I mean, yeah. I cannot think of formaldehyde in my vaginal tract. That's scary. Uh, so, so the bottom line is, um, you know, lactobacillus um, can, can be the one uh, primary thing. And I know I'm talking a lot, I'll, I'll let others share, but I've, I've been fascinated by the subject because we all, uh, at least I do, we think about probiotics uh, in fermented foods and in supplements, but, but they're looking at vaginal probiotics. And the four ways those could really help are, you know, blocking the pathogen attachment to the urethral cells, uh, producing hydro hydrogen peroxide right in that environment, which is the microbicide, uh, and maintaining that low pH. And then it, it promotes an anti-inflammatory kind of a cytokine response in those epithelial cells. So it's fascinating stuff, but it's vaginal probiotics, not necessarily oral. Oral does great stuff for the whole gut and all the other systems too. Yeah, so I mean, the vagina has its own biome, doesn't it? Much in the same way that the gut has its own biome. And so that could 
also become out of balance. You know, we, we talk about the gut microbes getting out of balance. So it kind of makes sense that if it was to be out of balance, you do something to put it back into balance. And I didn't know whether it was by eating something or if it was more like a pessary that you insert. Is that is that what you're talking about? Well, I, you know, the famous juries, are, um, I would say the research is looking at uh, hopefully down the road vaginal products that could introduce it directly into that area. And by the way, forgetting just about UTIs, I'm very much a fan of treating the problem where the problem is, not taking something that the whole body has to deal with, but, you know, focus on the problem area. So that makes sense to me. Uh, mm -hmm. Does it mean that if we ingest probiotics or have foods that are rich in that kefir and and fermented foods and so on. Does that is that not good? I don't think so. I'm sure it's helpful, but there's less evidence if you really want to get down to kind of evidence based data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. And this this is hard when when the evidence is emerging and still not really there to back us up. But but I know that uh, certainly in this book that I'm listening to, we we're, we're talking about the genes being the gun and the lifestyle being the trigger. So, you know, the, we can't exclude that possibility that the overall quality of the life that we lead, but that sounds a bit wrong, doesn't it? I suppose no. all the lifestyle factors that we could take into consideration and stress management, we've talked about that. And uh, we're kind of saying you, you are what you eat to a certain extent, aren't we? That, uh, you know, and I was listening to a fascinating, I mean, I'm always listening to fascinating things uh, about ultra processed foods this week. And um, what is it that makes them so difficult to say no to? And uh, seemingly the emulsifiers are starting to come into question in, the, in a recent piece of research. So not even just the salt and the sugar, but the emulsifiers. And I, you know, I just come back to the fact that if you can't pronounce it, you don't know what it is, and you see it on a label, just don't eat it, essentially. Yeah, stick to it. Does it grow in a field? Uh, can you catch it in the pond, you know? And I know, Jackie, you're, you know, you're definitely practice what you preach, don't you, when it comes to this? What we put in and, and around our bodies uh, is clear mm. as well. So any thoughts around that, Jackie? Well, in terms of just what you're saying, you know, what we eat and drink, yeah, it has to have an effect. It, it can't not, you know, because there's so much evidence of um, the effect that food has on other parts of the body, other diseases, diagnosis. Why is the bladder going to be any different? Why is that going to sit there as a little pocket that's not going to be touched by our lifestyle? It can't, it can't possibly be the case. So we mm. have to look at everything holistically we yeah we we need to take into account i even know for myself i mean i i do enjoy a glass of white wine but i know if i have a couple too many i can feel it okay it irritates the bladder yes it does so um that straight up is an answer for me knowing that something that i'm consuming can have a direct consequence so yeah. and and the more in tune we get with our with our inputs and outputs uh, you know, nursing was always about measuring inputs and outputs back in the day, wasn't it? Uh, you know, and so to, to take account of what is it that um, is having these potentially triggering some some shift, uh, and it could be something that you eat or drink, and the alcohol, uh, you know, dries us out, if nothing else. Coffee, caffeine as well. I know Claire's always talking about, let's not have any caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> Quite rightly, I, I don't disagree. Uh, Dr. B mentioned douching, and I was having a look in my uh, essential oils manual, Claire, this morning about uh, oils that might support us, you know, in this area of the body, and uh, and that we could use oils. We could massage them on. Apparently, we could use a compress. Uh, we could put them in a bath, and uh, we or we can inhale them, and you can. I think you can douche with them too. Am I wrong? Is you that... can put, you can soak them in a little natural sponge and um, insert them, oh. so they can sit there in a little natural sponge and be absorbed gently that way. Now I can only assume you're not talking about inserting them into the urethra at that point, no, because <laughs> as we all know, 
<laughs> well, <laughs> only finding it, then actually getting something in it that's foreign is not easy. But mm. if you have them oh, in the area, you can absorb them. Essential oils go where they need to go. So mm. that's how they work. Yeah. So which ones did you find were useful for this? Well, well, one that stuck in my mind was... Uh, Oh, what is it they take to baby Jesus? Frankincense. Frankincense. Mm. <laughs> okay, so frankincense, because vetiver and lavender in, la in relation to what Jackie's talking about, when you've got the kind of the mental stress that's a trigger, they're really good. And if I was going to use those to calm myself down, other than inhaling them, I would be rubbing them into the lower abdomen um, or, you know, having them in that area so they mm. went there but there's lots of oils that you could ingest in small amounts to help clear up any infection um or just to calm anti-inflammatory etc i have interstitial cystitis which was mm -hmm. only discovered when i had an abectomy i've had a dodgy bladder all my life and um, that has been directly caused by eating foods with high histamine content. Uh -huh. So for me, there is a direct relationship between what I eat, like you, Jackie, with your white wine, and what happens to my bladder. And my bladder is literally the telltale point for when I've eaten something I shouldn't be eating. I suddenly can't stop peeing. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm very aware of um, the link and would say there's a big one between diet and that's how I manage my interstitial cystitis by avoiding caffeine, by avoiding dairy. I don't avoid alcohol, but you know, I don't drink a lot of alcohol. I don't have a lot of mushrooms, literally anything my body doesn't like. It's like, oh, you're going to go to the loo now. So it's, yeah, I'd say for me, I mean, I think it's really interesting what you're saying, Dr. B, about this kind of, you know, deal with the problem in low in sight where you can like going to the location but I do think there is well there certainly is a relationship for me between what I eat and what's happening with my bladder and that is the same for my mother so that's an inherited yeah. kind of problem that's happened um Great. And I think if, if I may add too that that makes sense definitely uh first of all no one should. No one in medicine should ever have any judgment about any woman who has a, a problem with their body because they know their body best. <laughs> it's my theory. Uh, but I feel that uh, it's important for our viewers to understand that there's a very distinct difference between the condition of interstitial cystitis yes. and acute cystitis, which is the, the the medical parlance for UTI. So very, very different creatures. Uh, my hat's off to you because uh, interstitial cystitis, cystitis, I see, is a very complex creature. Uh, it can be lifelong, as you've described. It can be very, very uh, distressing in so many ways. Um, but that's very different than just, you know, uh, dare I say basic, but a basic UTI. Yes, agreed. Sorry. Yes, yeah. it is. Because yeah. it's not an infection. Yeah, it just very much feel yeah. like an infection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is that something that has any correlation with female, uh, you know, declining estrogen levels or not? Do you do you know what's being your? Actually, it's not related. I think that, uh, many, 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 many women with interstitial cystitis get it long before they go through menopause. And it can be decades even. I mean, they can get it in their 20s, uh, 30s. So uh, it's not associated with declining estrogen and actually not really hormonal necessarily. Although many women will say, you know, with adamant uh, assertion that, oh my gosh, yeah, things get worse around the time of my period if they're still pre-menopause. But, but truthfully, it's not related to that menopausal journey or, mm. or age. Mm. Is it something that gets confused with chronic urinary tract infections? I would say, in, in, from my perspective, uh, no, unless you have interstitial cystitis, because gosh darn it, you become the expert, you know what's going on, you know all the things about your body and, and so forth. But many, many, many women have recurrent, you know, uh, UTIs and it has nothing to do with interstitial cystitis. Mm -hmm. I would say it's important to distinguish, you know, so recurrence in the medical parlance means um, you know, greater than two UTIs in six months or greater than three in one year. That's kind of recurrent UTIs. And it's usually reinfection, not relapse. So relapse means you've treated it, but it's not quite on really and it comes back again versus like you have another infection again because of whatever you, you've done or not done. 
So mm -hmm. it's, it's very, very different. Okay, so um, we've talked a little bit about the kinds of things that we can do to prevent these, these uh, occurrences. We've talked to kind of intermesh that with some things that you might use to treat. We haven't talked about antibiotics. Um, that it, my understanding is if it's a bacterial infection, then uh, antibiotics would be the, uh, of course, an option for treatment. Um, and I mean, that's as much as I could say on the subject. <laughs> well, I could add a couple things on that. Um, uh, by the way, folks who don't know me, I'm usually the one trying to take you off your medications or not to prescribe medications. So it takes a lot for me to say, yeah, treat with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. I think antibiotics are overused, overtreated, and very uh, mis misused in so many ways and contribute to many um, problems down the road. But off my soapbox on that one, um, if you have a UTI, oh my gosh, <laughs> it's not usually E. coli, which is a nasty bug. And you, you need you need medication, you know, you, you can't just go take a bath and get better. <laughs> you know, you're, you're bleeding, you're hemorrhaging, you, you're, you're in agony, you may even have fevers, you may feel like you have flu, I mean, just affects the whole body. So antibiotics are very helpful. But here's the really important point, especially for women who don't have them very often. And so they're not really sure, or it's been such a long time. Uh, you have to do a culture because if you don't do a urine culture, if you just do a dip and it's positive for a bunch of things that indicate infection, then you never know what grows out. And if you don't know what grows out, there are different types of bacteria that can be caused uh, causing it. Then you can't target your antibiotics because then you can you know, see which is sensitive and which is not sensitive. So you want to really hone in on the right antibiotics. The other thing I'll add to this, which is a whole conversation in and of itself, but a lot of doctors don't even uh, interpret the cultures correctly. So it has, to, it all comes down to CFU, which is col colony forming units. So, you know, you think about a bench top, they're, they're putting a little sample in a petri tradition to see how much grows and they see what, what bug it is. It's usually E. coli. And then if there's not that, if there aren't that many colonies, so you have like, you know, 20 CFU per ml, that's not actually an infection. That just means you have bacteria. And there are many ways to help you that don't involve antibiotics. Uh, if you have greater than 100,000, which is the, the threshold colony forming units or CFU per ml, oh my gosh, you need antibiotics. So there is a lot of science there, but unfortunately it's not always recognized, especially when women maybe self-treat, they have antibiotics left over from a trip that, that they took just in case. And so they're taking them even though they may not need them. And so you really want to do it the right way. Yeah, you, I mean, you definitely do want to deal with antibiotics the right way. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, I know that I've heard about something called biofilms and in this context, uh, biofilms occur in different parts of your body and um, it's a way in which bacterial colonies can sort of be res very resistant to treatment. Uh, and uh, I, I know that one is uh, tartar on your teeth could be called a biofilm. Uh, oh. And if you think of tartar, it's, it takes a drill to get rid of it. If you actually mm. get to the point of uh, get to the point of having got a buildup of tartar, you know, you have to go to the old hygienist, and she's there with that metal hook thing, uh, scraping away. Um, and I have read about biofilms in the bladder being contributing to chronic mm. infection. Is this something that you're familiar with, Dr. B, at all, or? I'm not, but perhaps it, perhaps it's, it's the term that I'm not familiar with. I guess the concept uh, is there. There, there are. Uh, uh, I guess what I would say the the, the medical vernacular would be chronic colonization. Oh. So women who have bacteria that never really leave, oh. uh, and there's there's quite a kind of fork in the road approach to that. Um, many, uh, the knee-jerk response is like, oh, it's a culture, it's positive, it's greater than 100,000, boom, here's your antibiotics. 
But if you see a very savvy urologist, or probably any good urologist uh, who deals with this all the time, um, they will look at a number of other, of other factors. They will say if every single time we're checking the urine test, and every mm. single time the culture is positive, it's always the same yeah. organism, usually E. coli. Uh, and yet the woman doesn't mm. really have symptoms. They just donated urine for whatever, maybe it was a physical or some other reason yeah. they had the urine tested. There's no need to treat. Uh, we have bacteria, like you talked about, you know, the go, wow, we have good bacteria. Now, E. coli is not a good bacteria, but many women can be have, have chronic colonization that does not need to be treated necessarily unless they get sick, unless they have symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I mean, this brings us back to the mind. The mind is a very powerful uh, influence, isn't it? Um, the way we think our body feels is something that so we said last time when we were talking about the brain and uh you know that if you just give that a moment to sink in it's just incredibly powerful mm. it is just amazing to me this connection mm. between how we think and how we feel and that's not a judgment is it? You know, let's make that very clear. This is not a judgment. It mm -hmm. is merely an observation that this is uh, something that we are increasingly becoming aware of. And so, you know, it's also a tool, a tool that we can use, a tool that we can grab a hold of and use to our own advantage. And I know, Jackie, this really is your sphere of expertise. Have we got any tools for people who maybe, maybe they're in pain with this thing maybe it's such a worry to them uh you know where would we go with this yeah, i mean that there is um you know evidenced papers that hypnosis works really well for um lower uti pain um by utilizing i mean hypnosis is well known for managing pain anyway so yes we're just using it for a different part of the body so absolutely it invoke helps to invoke the pain gate theory as well because that is the mind allocating the point of pain so the mind absolutely um i do help women with ibs it's it's your thoughts it's the stress that's mm -hmm. triggering it mm -hmm. um also for bladder urgency as well. So not just UTIs, but there, there is a lot of women that do worry about just, well, can I, if I'm going out, can I get to a toilet? And especially as we are getting a little bit older and maybe pelvic floors aren't as strong as they were once. And so bladder urgency becomes something that is a, it's a trigger for worries. And once that anxiety with the urgency starts, then that starts to shrink life because people stop going out because they're worried that they're not going to have an access to the toilet. So this is something as well that um, actually over COVID has even triggered greater anxiety because ladies who were suffering with um, bladder urgency, because they weren't needing to go out anywhere, the anxiety in the mind was very, very safe. They were confined. They didn't have to go anywhere. Now the world's open again. It's a very fearful place to go out of because you've not had to worry about having to have access to a toilet. So it all sits in the mind. In terms of tools to work with, it, this really is, um, you know, anxiety techniques in understanding how to disassociate from that voice that is acting as the bully in the mind that it's very much learning to realize you don't have to listen to it but that's easier said than done so it goes it's not something that I can teach anybody in just five minutes this is sessions worth of teaching people how to do this how to be able to take the thought and throw it away because when you're feeling a thought that um, is attached to anxiety it feels very real you've got all the symptoms going on all over your body so to think that it's not real until you can believe that it's not real it's very hard to do that so it does go through a progression of sessions where they learn to believe, they build the belief in themselves that you can take control over your thoughts, that you don't have to listen to the voice of anxiety, that there is a different route that you can take with your own mind. And once you can do that, then yes, it becomes very liberating and freeing for people to realize that they can 
they can uh, get back out and enjoy life again. So the same with, you know, with um, UTIs. As I say, there was a paper that I was just reading the other day um, and they did conduct an experiment, UTI pain, and three months post-interventions, there was significant differences in pain threshold and that was still maintained six months post intervention as well through i think they had i think they were using something like six to eight sessions of hypnosis for dealing with it so that's helping the mind to control the pain and to control the stress and the anxiety that goes with it i think the the fear and anxiety just multiplies anything that you might be dealing with you know, whatever it is, it's multiplied exponentially by the fear factor, whether it's, um, you know, a, a joint problem, uh, a muscle problem, you know, whatever, you, you see that time and time again, whatever the problem is. So, uh, so yeah, let's take the fear out of it. Information helps with that, you know, that we, the more we can understand and know that you're not alone with these things either, you know, is the other thing. I suppose for me, uh, there is a little bit around the conditioning of tissues and so exercise the pelvic floor it's a muscle like any other there is evidence that exercises will help and I think toning the tissues increases the resilience of the tissues themselves you know anything where we're working muscles we're improving the oxygenation levels and so every cell needs this oxygen for its metabolism for its overall health and uh, and so we don't want the cells getting hypoxic uh, we want them to be firing on all cylinders it, it, wouldn't that be good um, and so the tone and then the other thing actually is a vaginal estrogen is something that women are being prescribed for gsm Genital urinary. Genital urinary syndrome. The cells are derived from the same embryonic tissues, uh, aren't they? Urethra and um, vagina, if I'm not wrong. So these are estrogen sensitive structures. And I know that vaginal estrogen can help to benefit the tissues of the vagina. Now, I don't know if it's just in the local area that you would get absorption and maybe that would help. I don't know, Dr. B, what do you think? Truthfully, I think, you know, if you treat the vaginal area, and there are many very simple products you can insert or, or apply with your finger or with an applicator or even just put on the outside, mm -hmm. um, they, they affect the surrounding tissues. Uh, there's, you know, there's a lot close in down there. And uh, so it really does uh, make a difference. You know, the opening of the urethra is right there. Uh, mm -hmm. And so um, it doesn't mean you're, you're, you're putting uh, any estrogen inside, but mm -hmm. things can track back. And so that can be very helpful. And I think the important part is if we're, if we're thinking about well, how bacteria get in, they have to enter there. Uh, they don't enter through the internal tissues of the body, they enter externally. So if we can treat that external area or the opening, that's going to be uh, very helpful. I wanted to get back to something Jackie said, which was really lovely. And and um, I definitely refer people for uh, acupuncture and for hypnotherapy and other remedies. Because um, if you get back to some of the science, there is a very, very direct connection between the bladder and the brain. And so when you urinate, there's a neurologic loop to the brain that tells you, you know, the bladder is a muscle. And so it has to tell you to contract that muscle so it expels the urine out or to relax the urethra so it allows, you know, the, the sphincter so, you know, urine can get through. So it, it's a natural extension to say, well, if we can fine tune and address that neurologic input, it definitely has uh, help. That's part of the basis for like bladder retraining. So if you go to like an occupational therapist or a pelvic floor therapist and your the urinary issues are a part of what you're you're concerned about, they can talk about kind of bladder retraining and part of it has to do with tolerating uh, the bladder filling, uh, because sometimes it fills to a certain point and you feel you have to go, but you know, you can maybe stretch it out a little bit more, uh, or vice versa, you know, you're just um, hardly ever going, okay, get on a schedule, kind of get that bladder retrained. Again, that neurologic system is being impacted. Yeah. So, you know, we can change how we feel by thinking different thoughts. We can change how we feel about things by even changing the aroma in the air, natural aromas that we love at our aromatherapy oils. We can rub them in, we can ingest them if they're the right ones, 
we can have a bath in them, we can have them permeating our homes, we can clean with them. I mean, you know, the possibilities are endless. Food is medicine, movement is medicine, and uh, the power of the mind just boggles my mind over and over and over again. And of course, where would we be if we didn't have medicine to help us, you know, when the going gets tough, the tough get going is all I'm going to say. And so thank you, ladies, so very much for taking the time out today to chat about this subject so openly because you know it can be a bit of a uncomfortable taboo type conversation to be having really thank you so much and uh, do check our conversations on my youtube channel check us out in the facebook moving through menopause group send us your questions you never know we might just have some answers for you take care